seated. Uh, before we pray, I, I want to recognize this is our first Sunday for two services. This is kind of the kickoff week, Wednesday night, everyone starts up. And we want to take a moment and, and pray for our Sunday school teachers, our Wednesday night KFJ leaders, our helpers. If you are a teacher or a helper for kids or adults, please stand up. I'm going to embarrass you. Uh, let's pray. God, I thank you uh, that you call us here this morning, that you've gathered us here. Uh, we pray that at the beginning of this, this fall season now, as kids are back at school, as sports are starting, as so much is going on, Lord, be with us now as we start things up again. As, as Sunday school begins anew, as uh, Kids for Jesus on Wednesday evening starts, as home Bible study starts, Lord, I pray for our leaders, for our teachers, for our helpers, for our administrators, Lord, I pray that you would bless them, that you would be near them. Uh, that you would bless them uh, in their preparation and in their ministry. Uh, through their kids, uh, we pray that it is a, a year of uh, kids behaving well, um, of kids listening, uh, knowing that that's not going to happen. Lord, we pray for patience, and we pray for love for these kids and the adults as well, who can misbehave sometimes too. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would bless this time. Lord, as a church, we, we pray for those who need around us and those who are celebrating around us. We, we thank you for marriage of uh, Eric Smith and, and, and Eric and Mandy Smith yesterday in Moorhead. Uh, I pray that you bless their marriage. Uh, I pray that you be with them on their honeymoon and the celebration that continues today. Uh, Lord, be with them and be near them. Uh, Lord, we pray for Josie and thank you that she is here with us this morning. I pray that you would continue to give her strength, uh, give her doctors and uh, nurses wisdom as they treat her. And Lord, I pray for healing. I pray that you would continue to restore Josie and, and remove the cancer from her. Uh, and Lord, this week as we celebrate with uh, Bill Floyd, uh, a year ago when he well, I can celebrate, but a year ago that he was diagnosed, but Lord, we celebrate that he is still with us, that he is stronger, that he is doing well. Lord, I pray that you would continue to bless him and strengthen him and their family. Uh, and Lord, now I, I ask you that you would come into our presence again with your spirit, that you teach us from your word, that you would give us wisdom from your spirit through your word. Bless us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week we started out in Genesis, and uh, in Genesis chapter 3, where we're getting to this morning, it's kind of like the starting point for understanding everything else. If you miss this chapter, if you don't understand what happens in this chapter, the rest of the Bible will forever and always be a mystery to you. It will make no sense if you don't understand what happened in Genesis chapter 3. We start out with this God who introduced himself. If you could sum up chapters 1 and 2, it would be this. I am God. I'm God. I created. I continue to sustain. I made you. You were not in the beginning. I was. And if we're going to know ourselves, we have to get that. That it's not in the beginning me. It was in the beginning God. And if God was in the beginning and God has made me in his image and his likeness, then I'm actually not my own. And there is somebody above me. There is someone that I will answer to someday. There is somebody there before me, and I'm not God. God said, I made you in my image. Man and male and female, both of you. I created you to do good things. And in Genesis chapter 3, I, I love uh, Robert Caton talks about the, the book of Genesis and the, the whole Old Testament, as a matter of fact, as like this movie, the movie of Genesis. And understanding story, I mean, we love stories, right? TV and movie wouldn't do very well if we didn't love story. We love it. We absorb ourselves in it. And if you pay attention, if you, if you, if you get suckered into the minutia, do you miss the story? You ever been the, the guy at the movie theater or sitting there with your wife picking apart what's happening on the story? Well, that wouldn't happen. That didn't happen that way. Oh, physically impossible. Couldn't happen. You ever do that? I, I'll totally raise my hand on that one. I'm terrible like that. When you do that, what do you do the rest of the story? You, you, you miss the point. You're missing the amazing point. Genesis is exactly like that. You can miss the point. You can know Genesis backward before and actually miss Jesus in, with, and under everything that goes on in the story. Genesis chapter 3 is the foundation for everything else that 
goes on in all of Scripture. This is Genesis 3, starting in verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. The serpent said to the woman, You will surely not die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and as the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took up its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. This beginning of Genesis, we see the first attack on what God had made. Uh, all through Genesis 1 and 2, what did God say about the things that he made? It was good. It was good. There, there's, there's an instance in there where God says there's one thing that's not good. Before sin entered the world, there was one thing that wasn't good. Do you ever know what it is? Yeah, Adam said, Adam, you're all alone. That's not good. I need to make a helper for you. You need Eve. And you see the first matchmaker in history. And Adam said, she's gorgeous. <laughs> he did. Ladies and gentlemen, like that to be? Eve was his standard of beauty. We don't know if she was short. We don't know if she was skinny. We don't know if she had a huge nose. We don't know anything about it. Adam looked at Eve, that's woman. Wow. She's gorgeous. God put the two of them together, and Adam sings this song at the end of chapter 2. And everything is then really good. There's this exclamation point, and God saw it, and it was really good. Adam and Eve were together, and it ends with this. They were naked, and they were ashamed. There's nothing to be ashamed of. Enter Genesis chapter 3. And the serpent comes and he starts an attack. We learn later on in scripture that the serpent is the devil. The serpent starts challenging. Do you notice who he goes after? How does he attack Eve? He said this. Did God really say? Luther said it's an attack on the word of God. What God had said. Now, we don't know when Eve heard this command. The command was given before Eve was created. God said to Adam, you can eat of every tree in the garden, but the one tree, you won't eat from that one. Period. It's the end of the command. Whether God said it again to Eve or whether Adam told Eve what God had said, we don't know. But Satan, for very crafty reasons, goes after Eve and not Adam. And I would suspect that Eve didn't hear the command to worship from God. She heard it from her husband. Because Eve distorts even what God said in her response. Listen to this. Did God say you won't eat of any tree in the garden? Which is obviously a major exaggeration. She said we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. True. God said that. But God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden. Neither shall you touch it or you will die. Did God say that? He said, can't eat. Could Eve have juggled with the fruit? Yeah, she could have used it for target practice. They could have made little silly animals out of it. Could have made jack lanterns, whatever. I don't know what kind of fruit it was. We don't know. She could have done anything with it. She adds to what God has said. Dangerous? <coughs> Very dangerous. By adding to what God has said, this serpent's got a, an in. What does he have to do? <coughs> if she can touch it, if she can just touch it and she doesn't die, he's got it. If she touches it and nothing happens, she's going to doubt God to be even more. He goes on. He's very crafty in where he goes with her. The serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. What did we say the theme of the first couple chapters of Genesis was? I am God. I am God. I created. I was here before. His first temptation to Eve is this. You can be your own God. You don't need Him. 
And ever since, we've been struggling and fighting to either prove that we're God or to somehow save ourselves. See, when we put ourselves in the throne, when we put ourselves in God's place, a couple things happen. First off, we make the rules. Does that sound like fun? Who doesn't want to make the rules? We love the idea of making rules. We can make them up as we go along, and we can change them as we go. That didn't work, so now I'm going to try this rule over here. That rule, I, you know, that, that worked for a little while, but I'll, I'll change it now to better suit me and my pleasure or whatever it is that I want. I can make up the rules. I can change the rules. When we put ourselves in that position, what happens when things go wrong is we keep trying over and over and over again to save ourselves. And life becomes a never-ending treadmill of trying to prove our worth, trying to fake our worth, or the misery of realizing that we aren't getting it done. That sounds a lot more like slavery than freedom. See, most of us like this idea that we can be free. When we say freedom, what do we usually mean? Free from what? The rules, free from mom or dad, <clears throat> anybody else telling me that that's wrong, free from all that. The, the story of the prodigal son. The son who goes off thinks he's going to find freedom. He's grown up in a rich man's home. He's had everything he could possibly imagine. All the wealth, all the riches, all the privilege, all the food, everything. His entire life has been handed right to him. And what does he want? He thinks he's going to find freedom outside of his father's home. And so he asks for his inheritance, and he goes off, and he thinks, party time. And for a little while, what he experiences feels like freedom. But it's a false freedom. What does he wind up doing? He doesn't keep spending his money. What will happen to his friends? If the party doesn't continue, where will his friends go? Will disappear. So he has to keep the party going. He needs people to believe he's a self-made, powerful guy. So he's got to keep buying and keep looking like he's cool, like he's got it all made. Even as his bank account dwindles lower and lower and lower, he's got to maintain that appearance that he looks strong and powerful and good, even while he knows He's failing miserably, and that everything that he had wasn't even his in the first place. Have to. Must. Sounds much more like slavery than freedom. Adam and Eve bought into the lie that you could be like God. And the fall happens because of this temptation. This is from Tully Division. Temptation is a false promise. When we give in to temptation, we are believing a lie. In the moment we are being tempted, there is a deeper temptation happening under the surface. Temptation has nothing to do with behavior. Look at that again. Temptation has absolutely nothing to do with behavior. Temptation has everything to do with belief. When we give in to temptation, it then affects our behavior. We're choosing to behave in a certain way. But temptation itself has nothing to do with behavior at all. It has to do with belief. Eve didn't believe God. Eve didn't believe that everything she needs, she already had. Here they are in the middle of this perfect garden. All the food, all the safety, all the strength. There's nothing, no reason to doubt that God was gracious, that God was kind, that God had set them up for good things. Eve doubted the word of God. Eve believed, chose to believe this serpent who told her that she could be sufficient all by herself. And there's Adam sitting right next to her, like a dope, doing nothing. We have the first passive husband who should have stood up and fought for his wife, who should have stood up and stomped on the snake. He knew 
As Eve said, well, we shouldn't touch it. He could have been the first one to step in and say, no, 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 no. God didn't say that. God said he shouldn't eat of that fruit. He sits passively by and doesn't do a thing. And then joins with his wife. And the fall is completed. The fall happened long before they ate the fruit. The fall happened when they didn't believe God. When their disbelief led them to the fruit of sin. See, sin is the fruit. Disbelief is the root. It's the root problem of every single one of us. When we believe that God isn't everything we need, when we believe that Jesus is not sufficient, when we believe there's something that we're missing, <coughs> something else that will fill the void, and if I could just get that, if I could just get that girl, that woman to love me, that'd be enough. If I could just... Just get that, that next paycheck, that next bump in pay. I mean, just get to that next level. If I could experience that next pleasure, if I could experience that next high, whatever it is, the root of our sin is our disbelief that in Jesus Christ, we already have everything we could possibly need. And there's an inheritance waiting that's even greater. By disbelieving God, they sever a relationship. And the very thing that God had created that was so good becomes not good. But we said this whole series is called Let There Be Grace. Because God knew that this was going to happen. And he still chose to create. And God walks into the garden. And what about him he do? I've done this before. It's like a little, it's like a two-year-old playing hide and seek with a grown-up, and they hide behind a cup. And they hunker down and figure if they close their eyes, you can't see me. See that? <laughs> hey, that's out of need. God's coming. Quick, a bush. It's like, okay, give me a break. God graciously walks into the garden, and anybody know the first words God utters to Adam and Eve? Where are you? He could have walked into that garden and simply said, if you're, if you're, okay, let's put on what your dad had. The kids are screwed up and they're hiding. Do you go look around the house and where are you? What do you say? Get over here now! Right? Everybody, get out! Front and center, get here now! And what's going to happen? Somebody's in trouble. <laughs> and usually it's like the, the first ones there are the ones who had nothing to do wrong. I didn't do it. It <laughs> wasn't me. I'm not in trouble. We could totally, could Adam even expected God to come in as the angry dad with a big stick? Absolutely. His words are words of grace. Where are you? Come out. Where are you? There is going to be a cursing. They brought it on. They knew the consequences. There will be consequences for sin. And just like Pastor Martha, that little drop of impurity into the perfect pitcher of water taints the entire thing. And all of mankind from this moment on, this is the problem defined by all scripture and the answer for which is Jesus Christ is the sin that infects every fiber of my being, every fiber of your being. God says, this isn't the end of the story. Where are you? Adam said, I heard the sound of you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman... And you gave me to be this. So in other words, it's your, her fault, and also it's kind of your fault because you gave her to me. Wow. The woman whom you gave me to be with, she gave me the fruit, and I ate. She had the first marital fight and the first reason for marital counseling. The Lord said, Woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. 
The Lord God said, The serpent turned from because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all the beasts of the field, and on your belly you shall go to dust, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring, or your seed, and her seed. He, the, the seed of Eve, the child of Eve, he will bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. And we have the very first promise of a seed, of a child, of someone who would come from Eve, a descendant, who would crush the head of the serpent. Exactly what Adam should have done while he was sitting next to his wife, listening in this conversation. Why do we keep have to hear the gospel over and over and over again? I don't know if you've noticed, but all of my sermons are essentially the same thing. It's my secret. It's the law and it's the gospel. Why can't we hear something else? Why isn't there isn't there something more we should be getting? Is there something I can't don't I ever outgrow this? Listen to this. Because sin. It's only the fruit of the problem. And unbelief is the real root of the problem. As long as you're a sinner, what that means is not that first and foremost you have a behavioral problem that you can outgrow, that you can get better at, but that disbelief. The gospel, if you can think of the gospel, it's like a reading of a will. It's a reassurance or maybe a full first time assurance that everything you need, you already have. When you believe that you've already got everything that you need, you are far less likely to leave this building and buy the fool's gold that's being offered to you. When you believe that all that you need, you already have in Jesus Christ, you are far more likely to take the fool's gold out of your pocket that you came with this morning and throw it out. Give it up. Because you realize and you know and in Christ, you've been given everything that you need. You don't have to live your life like a self-salvation project, proving to God that you've grown enough, that you've become somebody. You can give that up because the gospel is this assurance again and again and again that God calls you his daughter, that God calls you his son. The gospel never gets old to people who know now and always that you're a sinner. That we all have a sin problem. That we all have a problem of unbelief. And we need to hear it over and over and over again. It's drilled into our head. Romans says faith comes by hearing the gospel. Faith comes through hearing it. And because I sin all the time, and so do you, I need to hear that gospel message over and over and over again. It's my only hope to deal with a sin problem that's on my surface, is to believe more and more that I don't need to go chasing after all those, thi all those things. I don't need to find my self-worth in how well my kids are, do are doing. I don't need to find my spiritual value in how well I'm behaving or how much I'm doing or how much I'm giving, I can find freedom in Christ. Because he's given me everything that I need. And freedom leads to joy. <coughs> and who doesn't like working with a happy person? Gratitude is the only proper motivation to service. And the amazing part is we have got everything to be grateful for. Because even as we live our lives and struggle with this, with sin, with putting ourselves in God's place, God keeps coming back over and over and over again. And you know what he says? Where are you? Where are you? I've got good news. Jesus did it all. Pray, God, I thank you. I thank you that you don't come to 